Let's be frank about one thing. This pandemic, I think, has caught everybody off guard. The speed, the way this thing is mutating, the way that governments have responded. I don't think anybody anticipated that things would turn out this way. But the answer is yes, but not in the conventional way. I would have said two things. Number one, this decade, in this decade, the 2020s, we're going to see technology allow man-made viruses to emerge viruses that are made by and designed uh, by a rogue group uh, will be unleashed on the world. And secondly, and this is something that I've said uh, to the Senate of Canada and a few others, which is that without technology, the healthcare systems of the world uh, could collapse if there's an unexpected event that takes place, be it, be it a cyber, cyber attack, be it a epidemic or a pandemic that governments need to have technology at the head of at the center of their healthcare system in order to ensure that their societies can stay afloat, can survive, can thrive. a little bit differently. AI actually, there's a startup in Canada called Blue Dot. And Blue Dot was the first to actually identify that a virus was emerging in Wuhan. So it used AI system. It's an AI startup that identified that something's happening there. And then it advised its clients on December 31st, which is several days before the global health authorities. So AI has been at the center of this pandemic in, in all kinds of ways. You have the United Kingdom, which is currently using a system called Cough in a Box, which uses AI to monitor and, and analyze the sound of your cough to diagnose you with COVID. You have stadiums. EuroCup just took place in Europe and many stadiums use facial recognition cameras to monitor the temperature to see if somebody has a fever. And you even have AI being used in like South Africa places like South Africa, where they're using AI to predict what the next wave of COVID will look like and what areas will be most affected. So AI has been at the center of this pandemic. And even more so, you have the National Science Foundation, NSF in the United States, they have, they're using AI to predict the next pandemic. So AI has played a massive role. And even if you look at other parts of the world, they're using now AI to clear the backlog because many elective surgeries were delayed because of the pandemic. It was only ICU that was allowed. And now you have a multi-year backlog. So how do they allocate who gets the surgery, who doesn't? So they're using AI for that. So AI has played a very significant part during this pandemic. Definitely, definitely this pandemic has totally transformed geopolitics in several ways. The first way is that for the first time, a global crisis took place and the world didn't just turn to the West for help. Before in 2008, you had the, glo the global recession and it was mainly the G7 that figured out what to do. And the whole world kind of followed whatever the G7 said. But in this case, you have countries like Russia and China that supplied vaccines and you have countries that didn't need to depend on the United States or on the United Kingdom or on Germany, and you could go to those countries. And that is a fundamental paradigm shift in geopolitics, that the countries that have kind of governed the world and defined the world are no longer in control anymore. And the second big uh, transformation for geopolitics is that the timeline, the timeline of when geopolitical change was supposed to take place has shrunk. So I've been talking about for years, geopolitics of technology. And in my books, 
I gave timestamps, 2028, 2032, 2043. And I'll tell you, in this pandemic, things have become almost like they are happening on a week-to-week basis, right? Years have turned into months, months have turned into weeks. So things are happening a lot faster than anyone even anticipated. And lastly, I'd say maybe the biggest transformation is that you have the whole world trying to unplug from China. The whole world is trying to move supply chains. The whole world is trying to localize, become self-reliant. And that's going to redesign how the world works. And it goes to a new paradigm that I've coined, which is the world is vertical. The world is becoming vertical. Countries are using technology to establish new barriers in the world. And that's going to redesign everything. Well, really the big difference, the big differentiating factor between, I'd say the US in one group and China and Russia in another group is that China and Russia data is centralized. The government is collecting data, they're centralizing that data. So one example is what recently happened with Ant Group. Ant Group is one of the largest payments companies in China. They're owned by Alibaba, which is Jack Ma, the largest e-commerce company in the world. And China went after Ant Group cracked down on Ant Group, and what came after? What came after is a new state-backed firm for all of Ant Group's data. All the data that Ant Group has had will now be placed in this state-backed firm and then shared with other state-backed firms. So data is now becoming centralized in these parts of the world. In the US, it's a different story. In the US, it's the private sector. It's technology companies, big tech, that's collecting massive amounts of data on, on everything, and they're using it for a variety of reasons, some good, some bad. But I think that the big conversation that's missing is not necessarily in data protection, although that's an important topic, it's in how data is being used. We've lived in an era where we knew our data was being collected with intelligence agencies, our phone calls were being listened to, our text, message, text messages were being read, emails were being monitored, but that didn't, restrict how we lived. It was annoying, it was a concern, but that didn't stop you from traveling somewhere. That didn't stop me from going to a particular school. It was an unfortunate event, but it didn't define us. Now we're living in an era, and we're at the precipice of this era, where data is going to define and drive how we live. The social credit system in China is a perfect example of that. Everything that you do, if you jaywalk, if you pay your bill late, If you do something else, if you're commenting on the government online, you're given a score and that score now defines how you can live. And it's not just in China. People think about this and they say, oh, well, that's a communist country. Even in democracies in the United Kingdom, you have citizen scores emerging, scores that are being given to citizens that are defining how they can access healthcare in New Zealand. And I love New Zealand. I was born in New Zealand, but New Zealand has an algorithm right now that's predicting which immigrants will use up more health care or, or commit crime. And based on this prediction, New Zealand is either not giving the visas or is deporting people. So think about that. Data now is deciding and defining and driving how we live, how we function. And that has to be understood. There's serious ethical and social dilemmas here. Well, the EU is a huge economy in itself. It's not a small power. It's had a place in the world for, in many ways, European countries for centuries have defined and driven the world, first through colonialism and now in the post-World War II world with the EU as as an economic union. But the big challenge the EU faces is that it's stuck between two superpowers, the United States on one hand, the established, the biggest ally of the EU, and China. And the EU is now being forced to either pick a side or redefine its position and role in the world. And it's very interesting what the top EU foreign policy official recently said, that we align with the US, we align with the democracy of the United States, with the ideology of the United States, the ideals of the United States. So it's clear that on the foreign policy front, the EU has picked its side. 
But when it comes to AI specifically, the EU has made a different bet almost, a different gamble. They've realized that they can't compete holistically, holistically with the Chinese or the Americans or even the Japanese or Indians or Israelis. They can't compete on every single front. Uh, chips, healthcare, business, commercial AI. So what they're doing is they're focusing on specific areas, specific areas where they know that they can excel. So one example is ethics. Uh, the EU wants to build ethics, AI ethics that the whole world uses. Another example is semiconductors. By 2030, the EU wants to account for 20% of the world's semiconductor production. It's 10% today. The question in front of the EU and, and the challenge that the EU is going to face is how does it convince the world to follow it? It's nice and dandy to say we're going to create AI ethics for the whole world, but how do you convince South Africa or Brazil or Indonesia or Hungary to adopt these ethics? And what's stopping these countries, what's stopping Hungary from creating its own AI ethics and trying to lead the region or the world itself? That's the big million dollar question. However, the EU plans to convince countries is it's their foreign policy. But my belief is that the one way for a nation to win over another nation is to identify whether that nation is like-minded. What I mean by that is we've lived in an era where the whole world has been globalized, integrated. The whole world has been almost woven together. If Hungary had a trade issue, it went to the WTO. If Hungary had a diplomatic issue, it went to the UN. If Hungary had a health issue, it went to the WHO. If Hungary wanted to connect its financial system with the whole world, it joined SWIFT. Right? These are systems that have connected the whole world, so it didn't matter whether you were like-minded or not. But now what we're seeing is countries only want to work with like-minded countries. So whether it's the EU trying to convince Hungary or Hungary trying to convince other nations, I believe it's only going to succeed if these are like-minded nations. Absolutely. And the reason is because AI is going to be at the center of the new design of nations. AI is not just about military. It's not just about autonomous weapons. AI is not just about commercial. It's not just about the algorithms in the, in the servers managing our data. AI is about everything. Tomorrow, Hungary may decide that it wants to import AI doctors. Or tomorrow, Hungary may decide to deploy AI teachers. So AI is going to be at the center of every single sector in an industry of a country. And in order to ensure that a country can not only protect itself from geopolitical aggression, but can grow, that can help their people thrive with AI and succeed with AI and rise up with AI, you can't have a quarter to quarter strategy. You can't even have a 12 month strategy. You have to have a five, 10, 15 year strategy that's holistic in nature. Otherwise, you're gonna face all kinds of headwinds. One example, if Hungary tomorrow wanted to import AI doctors, and let's say that they import AI doctors from the United Kingdom. And then in the future, within 12 months, 24 months, 48 months, Hungary and the UK clash over some issue, and the UK bans those AI doctors. It effectively crashes the Hungarian healthcare system. That's the risk. So every single aspect, every nuance, has to be thought through. Definitely, because if you think about how governments have approached technology for many years, for many decades, technology has always been an afterthought. Technology was never the priority. Priority always was other variables, and technology was always thought about after. But now technology is at the center of anything that a country wants to do. Sustainability is an, a great example. If a country wants to be sustainable, it's technology that will ultimately make that successful. Right now, there's a lot of talk about solving climate change. And we have these agreements. We had Kyoto, we had Doha, we have Paris. And if these agreements were actually going to work, there wouldn't be so many of them. I believe the real driver, the real solution is technology. Bacteria that can eat plastic, paint that can absorb sunlight, 
new forms of energy. This is truly the way that sustainability is going to be solved. So technology has to be at the center of, of whatever a nation is thinking. It's possible. We need to understand both sides of the coin. And in many ways, that analogy is also old because we've lived in a world where there's black and white. It's gray now, there's a spectrum. And we have to understand every single part of that spectrum. So there is the risk that AI will pose a threat, not just to jobs, but to humanity. You have the projections of how many jobs are at risk from robots. One example is Ethiopia. You have one projection, one calculation that 85% of jobs, 85% of jobs are at risk of being automated. Now, if you take that and you say, okay, maybe they're wrong by half, right? It's still a lot of jobs. And the question has to be asked, what are these people going to do? And this leads to the geopolitics of automation, which is you could see the rise of new political parties, radical political parties. Look what happened in the US in 2016. You have a candidate that emerges that says, says many things, but says, we're gonna bring back jobs from China. Very powerful statement and an important statement, but we're gonna bring back jobs from China. So what if the next political candidate in some part of the world is, we're gonna bring back jobs from robots. We're gonna protect jobs from technology. We're gonna ban companies that automate jobs. So you have one side is big social, big, big economic, big geopolitical challenges. But at the other side, you have what I believe is the, the human ingenuity, the human spirit, the optimistic side, which is that can we as humans create the new jobs? Can we as humans imagine and design the new occupations? Because the world that we live in, all of these jobs were created by us. They weren't created by robots. We, if we can create these jobs, however, tens of thousands or millions of different occupations that exist today, what's stopping us from creating the next set of jobs? It's probably one of the biggest risks that all of us face today because as in geopolitics, most of geopolitics is 60,000 feet in the air, right? It's, it's always been about oil or natural gas, but this is an issue that's very personal. It's individual specific. You can't post things anymore without being concerned that you might be banned. And if not banned, you might be canceled or you might have other challenges emerge for it. being doxxed is another example. So tech companies have a big responsibility to play. And I know a lot of people in tech companies and most people working in technology companies, if not all, are benevolent people. They're great people, they're hardworking people. But the role that technology companies play, they I don't think that they imagined that they're gonna play such a serious role in society, but the real culprit in all this, the real you know, group to blame is governments. Governments are the ones who have been asleep at the steering wheel. These companies have been emerging for years and it's only now when they realize that their elections could be influenced or they realize that foreign powers could use social media companies that they said, we need to take on big tech. So really governments should have been acting proactively for many years and they haven't. And it's imperative now that governments accept the role that technology companies play in society. We're not going back to the way things were. Technology companies have become equal to governments and their ability to control, influence, dominate, drive the world. That has to be accepted by government. So all of this talk of breaking up technology companies, it's very dangerous talk, especially in capitalist societies, because what you're doing is you're almost telling future entrepreneurs, don't become big, don't become successful. If you become too big, we're gonna break you apart. That's not the kind of signal you wanna send. That's the dynamic that I'm talking about, is that these companies are in many ways equal to governments. 
that that has that paradigm has to be accepted. They're not governments, but they are. They have to be accepted for governments as governments, and they're doing many things that are only going to anger governments more. For example, many technology companies are building the, the new internet cables that are connecting the whole world. So now they're going to almost control what kind of content societies can have access to. The real question has to be asked: What? Why aren't governments taking action? That's a question I've asked many times. And it's a question that seems to elude almost everybody I ask because there's many powers that governments have. Look at Nigeria. Nigeria has banned Twitter. Look at India. India has just pa passed a law that makes Twitter responsible for every single tweet. Every single tweet that's posted by an Indian user in India, Twitter is now liable for. So there are many tools that governments have. The question is, why are they not using them? 